Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Promoting diversity or engaging in racial discrimination? That's the question that's being debated in a federal lawsuit against Harvard University, one of the most sought after and selective schools in the country. The lawsuit charges that under the guise of trying to achieve racial and ethnic diversity among its students, Harvard has in fact established a quota for Asian Americans that keeps many from being admitted. Is Harvard discriminating against Asian Americans or is the lawsuit, as some charge, actually part of a strategy to eliminate affirmative action that benefits all minorities? Here to discuss the lawsuit and its ramifications are Jeannie Park, president of the Harvard Asian American Alumni Association, and Margaret Chen, a sociology professor at Hunter College. Both are board members of the Coalition for Diverse Harvard. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. First of all, how would you characterize Students for Fair Admissions, the group that's bringing the lawsuit against Harvard? Okay, so um, Students for Fair um, Admissions is actually a group that uh, uh, was um, developed by Edward Bloom, who was actually the architect in the uh, Fisher versus University of Texas lawsuits. And both times, Ed Bloom and Abigail Fisher um, failed, um, I guess, overturning race conscious emissions at the University of Texas. And because he failed, he decided to change his um, tactics and instead recruited Asian American students as the new plaintiff. And so that's the, the, um, the background behind him. But he's a legal strategist who is uh, determined to overturn race conscious emissions. And he's also determined to overturn the Voting Rights Act as well. OK. So how would you describe the Coalition for, Di for, Di for a Diverse Harvard, which is taking Harvard's side in the lawsuit? So the Coalition for Diverse Harvard is a group of about 1,100 alumni, um, some students and faculty as well. And we came together to support an inclusive admissions process, which we know was key to creating the diverse class and student body that was so important to all of us and to our educations. We truly believe that this diversity is vital to what Harvard is trying to do in terms of producing leaders for diverse communities and um, teachers, uh, you know, scientists, all, all manner of, um, of uh, kinds of work that the graduates are going on to do and how important that diversity is in all different kinds of work. Now the lawsuit is suggesting that Harvard is discriminating against people like you, but you are supporting Harvard. So you obviously disagree with the uh, the allegations of students for fair admissions? Well, again, it's the mission of this lawsuit that we are very much against. I mean, I think all of us absolutely oppose racial discrimination against any group. But if you look at what the lawsuit asks for, it asks for um, admissions to become race blind. That is the one thing that they are seeking and that, and that Edward Bloom, you know, he's also sued uh, the University of North Carolina for this uh, very same purpose. And in our minds, to have a, an admissions process that is race blind is simply ludicrous. I mean, uh, your racial, ethnic, cultural background is so much a part of what you bring to the college and bring to um, the experience that will, will, be, will contribute to everyone's education. And to ask students to not even, you know, he has said he doesn't even want students' names to be revealed. And yet, in a, in a whole person admissions process where the admissions office really tries to consider all aspects of your life's journey um, to sort of assess and evaluate what your potential is going to be. I mean, how can you expect students to not talk about their, you know, their immigration experiences, their family experiences, their community um, activities? And so this just seems to go against everything that um, the college is, is uh, you know, trying to pull together in terms of in terms of its community. Tell me about. Um, I gather both of you seem to feel that you benefited from the racial and ethnic diversity that you experience at Harvard. Talk about that. Well, I can say that I benefited definitely there at Harvard, but also from the very beginning when I was recruited um, to be a student at Harvard. 
Um, I am um, a first generation college student. My mom was a garment worker, my father was a waiter, and at the time when I was looking at colleges when I was 17 years old, they thought, I'm a New Yorker, they thought that I should go to a place that was close by. So I had applied early to Princeton and got in, and Harvard was never on my radar. Um, but my, uh, my friends in high school brought me down to Chinatown uh, specifically to a recruitment event geared toward Chinese Americans. And there I met Harvard recruiters, Harvard Asian American recruiters who went out of their way to convince me to apply to Harvard. Um, and lo and behold, I, um, I decide to apply and I, decide, and I get in. And they said, hey, you know, think about applying to Harvard think about going to a city school, because we are, and I get in and right from the get-go I realize race mattered at the very beginning to even think about going to school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about once you get there? I mean, So once I get there, I meet people from different backgrounds and I also learn about myself. I learn that um, since it's a liberal arts school, I learn that there's not much written about my parents. For example, my mother, who's a garment worker, I decide, you know, later on, I realized, you know, that should be my career. And now, as a sociologist, I can say, because I went to a diverse school with a diverse community, I felt I should learn a little bit more about my background. And I'm a sociologist actually um, studying communities of color. Students for Fair Admissions alleges that Harvard has a quota for Asian American students, just as it did actually have one for Jews back in the 1920s. Do you think that's true? You know, I think that Harvard is such a different place than it was back in the 1920s. I mean, we're talking literally a hundred years ago. And, you know, Harvard is now admitting classes, college classes each year that are actually majority and minority. I mean, this is a university that is absolutely looking toward the future. I mean, they are trying to build a class that is going to, as I said, produce the leaders of the future society that we're going to live in, and actually the society that we already live in. So I don't think you can really compare at all the Harvard of today to the Harvard of 100 years ago. I mean, ironically, this lawsuit and what Edward Bloom is trying to do would actually turn back the clock and return Harvard more to a time when it was, um, your entry was determined by your privilege and, and when um, you know, whites had, had much more of an advantage in getting in. And so you know, this, we are trying to um, kind of preserve ways for the university to really ensure diversity, to increase educational opportunity for everyone, and to again improve the educational experience for the whole class. Now it does appear uh, and I'm, I'm looking at the, you know, the, the, the brief uh, in the lawsuit against Harvard. It does appear that Harvard engages in some racial balancing, as indicated by the fact that the respective percentages of African Americans, Hispanics, uh, Asian Americans, Native Americans, whites, have remained pretty much stable, at least for the last decade. Um, sort of like 18 percent, 16 to 18 percent Asian Americans like in the last decade. Does this cause you any concern? Well, I was going to say actually the percentage of this latest class I got into Harvard uh, is closer to 23 okay. percent of 2022. Okay. And over the last decade, the percentage of Asian Americans actually has gone up from about 17 percent to I think um, Closer to 22 or 23 okay. percent, so it hasn't remained steady, and there are ups and downs, but the trend has been upward. And um, because they are now majority people of color, it also indicates that the other groups of color have also risen and going up and down each year too. It's really a majority of, of students uh, at Harvard now are people of color. That's what that's what it says. The majority of the incoming class. Okay. The okay. incoming class. Okay. Margaret, in a report that you wrote in 1983, Admissions Impossible, you found that while the number of Asian American applicants to Harvard was soaring, Harvard's enrollment of Asian Americans was barely increasing. Um, you weren't happy with admissions procedures at the time, but are you happier now? Is, Har is Harvard doing better? Uh, I believe so. At the time, in 1983, um, 
Let me, in 1983, uh, when we wrote this, I think Asian Americans just started to become um, um, noticed on the scene at admissions, just like they were trying to recruit me back then. Right. Um, they were just beginning to be noticed. And we believe at the time, the people who wrote that report were a bunch of uh, um, students from many of the Ivy League schools all up and down the East Coast and other selective schools. We thought that the admissions officers didn't understand um, Asian Americans and had many stereotypes. And so when we wrote this report, we actually felt that we were trying to educate the admissions officers on who Asian Americans were or are back then. And now, you know, back when I uh, went to Harvard, I believe there were only 130 Asian Americans in my class. The latest class has over 350 admitted. So in my view, they've done a lot better. And in my view too, um, 1976 was when Asian Americans were included in race conscious admissions. Asian Americans have only benefited from race conscious admissions. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. Then we'll be back with Jeannie Park and Margaret Chen after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Jeannie Park and Margaret Chen, board members of the Coalition for a Diverse Harvard. Harvard's one thing that has been criticized is Harvard's use of legacy admissions, um, which seems, you know, you know, admitting students whose like, parents have gone to, relatives have gone to Harvard. Uh, and it seems to work in favor of white applicants and against applicants of color. Do you think Harvard should do away with legacies? I mean, there are a number of factors like legacy that do favor, again, you know, white students, students who are more privileged. And even though that's not a main part of this lawsuit, I mean, I think personally, you know, I'm not in favor of something that is essentially perpetuates privilege. But I think what's important in the context of this lawsuit is to see that there are so many other factors that, that um, you know, where Asian Americans perhaps do not fare as well. I mean, legacy, even geographic diversity, for instance, for students of color, it tends to work against them because students of color tend to live in urban areas. And so I think part of what's sort of the misinformation around the lawsuit is the kind of fixation on the aspect of, of including race and ethnicity is just a, you know, what is a very, very limited factor in admissions. I mean, that is the only legal, um, legally allowed use of race. And, and, um, and again, to forget about all these other factors that actually go into admissions and, and, and don't work in favor of students of color. Yeah, so are you in favor of scrapping legacies then? <laughs> I said personally, I'm not in favor of, of policies, policies like legacy, but I haven't really delved into all of yeah. that so deeply. Yeah, and and the other thing is the Z list, which I learned about from this lawsuit, uh, which allows academically less competitive students whose parents donate large sums of money to the universe to Harvard to be at, admitted. How about the Z list? Should, is that something uh, that? works against diversity perhaps should be eliminated? Well, whenever anybody mentions the Z-list, the only thing I could think of is Jared Kushner. And so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, so, so I, I don't think um, that is um, uh, quite a good way of uh, admitting students uh, to Harvard, but, uh, um, but to, to focus a little bit more on what this is about is that Asian Americans who do apply, we also have to think that the Asian Americans are actually a very diverse group in the United States. Uh, we are actually uh, the, a group with the highest uh, income inequality now in the United States. So we have the very poorest of any group and the very richest of any group when we look at income. So when we think about that and the disparities within the Asian American group, we can actually see things like the Z-list may not work in their favor and things that uh, look at race conscious emissions may actually do work in their favor as well. Now, Students for Fair Admissions uh, says it wants to, Harvard to adopt race-neutral alternatives to achieving diversity. For example, uh, giving preference to students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, increased use of financial aid, scholarships, 
and recruitment to attract and enroll minority applicants. Um, in the coalition for uh, a diverse Harvard's brief, you argue that there are better remedies for racial discrimination in admissions than what um, the plaintiff is advocating. So talk to me about that. Um, so, and we actually, we actually still believe that race should matter, as well as many other factors. We think that holistic admissions should stay in place because we believe that, uh, as you said, geographic diversity matters, a person's background matters, what high school they went to mattered, um, what, um, what activities they participated matter. If they did not do activities, are there reasons why they didn't do activities? Were they working to support a family? All these things matter, but more so, but in also including race, because we also believe that race matters in everyday life. And, um, and if you try to be race neutral, you're actually ignoring all the things that happen, that's happened to a person up until the time they've applied to college. So for example, as an Asian American, a lot of people think that we're forever foreigners, no matter how many generations we're here. And people forget that we actually grow up that way, you know, up until we're 17 and even till now, people still think we're forever foreigners. You know, there have been many studies and a lot of research done on other ways to create diversity within a college class. And so this idea of just looking at socioeconomics and not looking at race, of course, has come up quite a bit. But the research has shown that if it you doesn't just, quite work. It doesn't no. work. You actually need to look at both. I mean, Harvard actually um, has made quite a push in recent years to recruit first generation students, students who are the first in their families to go to college. That's been a major, major effort. And, and so, and that often correlates with socioeconomics. But these are the kinds of things, you know, that, that Harvard wants to be able to look at all these factors. Are you the first in your family to go to school? Are you going to a school in a neighborhood that's very under-resourced so you don't have the same access to test preparation, to AP level courses, you know? Um, in addition, what kind of community do you come from? What are the are the cultural norms and expectations in your community. And so you need to be able to look at all of these factors. And so to take out just, you know, to take out just one, which I, I think all of us would agree is, is, a, is a big factor in American yeah. life, in American society, um, that just, that, you know, it really hampers um, being able to create that diversity. And we know that students who go to school in more diverse environments, they're more likely to interact, you know, with people of, of different backgrounds and to form those, those bonds. Um, anyway. And also, if you look at just um, socioeconomic level, I know as regards to African American students, if you're just looking at the, the poorest, the most economically challenged. Sometimes, if you're looking at middle class um, black students, um, they're the ones who are more likely to do well at Harvard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to eliminate them, exactly. you know, exactly. uh, they're, because they're, they're the ones who are most prepared, for, you know, for, for a Harvard education. Exactly. So the uh, whole socioeconomic thing doesn't work. Right, you know, there's all, all these groups. interactions, exactly. Right that if you um, took out one factor, you wouldn't be able to see it, or you're trying to ignore those factors. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But do you think Harvard can do better by Asian American student applicants? Well, well oh. <laughs> and if so, how? how? I mean, in, in terms of, of remedies, um, you know, we certainly acknowledge that there are implicit biases um, that all of us hold about all kinds of, of people and different backgrounds, different genders and all of that. And so, you know, we certainly would expect that the admissions office is highly aware of the kinds of biases that might play into a student's record, you know, in terms of the recommendations they might receive, the school reports, in terms of um, maybe, you know, an interview report, and to be highly attuned to that. So we would certainly expect them to have training in this kind of implicit bias, to have a diverse uh, admissions office, to have diverse alumni interviews. I mean, these are the things that we think are important to addressing any kind of bias. But again, that requires being highly conscious of race and ethnicity, not being race blind. I mean, it seems that 
being raised blind is kind of exactly the wrong mm -hmm. remedy because then you have no idea of what you're really, you know, dealing with and what the kind is of, of, of circumstances might be in, it, in the student's application. Turning to an issue closer to home, Asian American students comprise more than 70% of the student body at Stuyvesant High School and more than 60% of students at Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech, uh, considered the city's three most elite public high schools. Um, even though Asians, I don't know what percentage of Asians are in the public schools, but it's not 60%, uh, not 70%. Not, not 70%. Um, and there's been talk about changing that and allowing more blacks, Latinos into those specialized, getting, how do you get more of them into those specialized schools? What do you think of Mayor de Blasio's proposal to offer, I think it's 20% of the seats in, um, in, in the specialized schools to students from high poverty area middle schools? And I think he wants to eventually eliminate the written test for those special high schools. What do you think about those proposals? Well, um, Saeed Ali and I have actually been doing um, uh, research on this particular topic. And both of us actually feel that there, are, there aren't a lot of similarities between this and Harvard. But the one thing that's similar between Mayor de Blasio and Chancellor Carranza's and <laughs> I have to say Edward Bloom's tactics is that they are trying one to... One thing that's similar. Similar. Yeah. Is that they are trying to uh, raise animosity between communities of color. And so that's a tactic that we think that is not a good way uh, to start addressing this issue. Secondarily, we actually believe that if you look at the specialized high schools uh, that use the test for admissions, they only comprise 6% of the middle school students and that they should actually address what's going on with the other 94% of the students. And that, I believe, um, black parents, Latino parents, Asian American parents, and white parents want a more rigorous uh, school system, want better schooling for their children. And that's something they ought to work on and focus on what they actually can change. So to be a little more specific, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech are the three schools that are mandated by the state to use the test for admissions. All the other high schools don't need to use the test. Actually, the mayor and the chancellor could actually decide how they want to do, uh, how they want to admit students to those high schools, but we also believe that education should begin at the very bottom. Should look at kindergarten through fifth grade, through the middle schools to see how they can enhance education there. Jeannie, you have thoughts about that? I think that, you know, all the many school systems, I mean, there was just a big article in the New York Times earlier this week about another school system, I think, was in, in Maryland, Maryland, that is also looking at ways to diversify and to address the inequalities of opportunity and the inequalities of, um, you know, access to education, again, to, to things like test prep, um, and how to make sure that schools are are open to all students from from the beginning and certainly um, I know that you know people will say well the problem starts at kindergarten or preschool or even earlier so you know um, we shouldn't have to worry about it by the time you get to college but absolutely I think every part of the educational system has a role to play in increasing opportunity I mean you know education is 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 the launch pad it's for it's the way that um, you know, that you raise families out of, of difficult circumstances and, and you bring, you know, communities up. And, and so we need to make sure that there is access to that for everyone and to, to be worried, you know, to think about who are the people with the least opportunity, not focusing so much on who are the people with the most opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your organizations, we only got about a minute late, uh, left. What do your uh, Harvard alumni, um, students for our diverse Harvard, what kinds of activities are you involved in, um, in generally, and also that might connect to education? Well, a lot of what we do is, has been, honestly, education <laughs> of our, um, of our members, of the alumni, of the students. I mean, we, there are a lot of questions out there about 
about the lawsuit, about all sorts of issues regarding diversity on campus. And so we kind of serve as an independent, I guess, information service in a way. We mm -hmm. get a lot of questions from around the world, frankly, from alumni and students. About what it's like for an Asian student at Harvard? Is well, that about that or sometimes. about, you know, yes, some of that and sort of what is what is happening at Harvard in terms of diversity, what mm -hmm. is going on in, in admissions. I mean, we don't have all the inside information, but we try to stay on top of it. I mean, there's been, there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of papers filed in this suit, and we, we try actually to read <laughs> almost all of them and sort of to be able to decipher them for people because there is so much misinformation out there. It is a hot topic and you know, as we said, people tend to grab on to the most sensationalist headline, but we wanna make sure people understand the facts and what's really at stake. Okay, well it's a case that certainly intrigues me, which I, which is why I was happy to have you both on to explain it <laughs> to us. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We're out of time. I want to thank Jeannie Park and Margaret Chen for joining me today. For more information on the Coalition for a Diverse Harvard, you can visit its website, diverseharvard.org. For One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>